me, designing synthetic organisms is, 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 and we've heard a lot about DNA. So, you know, when you talk about processes and techniques, you've already heard a lot about the DNA techniques. I think I'll take it a notch up today, and I know it's going to be... I'll give you just a brief historic introduction to synthetic biology, molecular biology, recombinant DNA technologies. Uh, just to sort of frame the whole thing, I hope that will maybe last uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, just some famous examples of technology development uh, over the last 50 years, approximately. Um, then I'll then it'll become a little more hard to actually tell you a few examples in detail how do you actually build DNA these days. And then even further detail, I want to talk about a specific DNA engineering technology that I helped developing. So that's really close to my heart. Um, and then basically try and frame the whole thing at the end. So just to recap, just a uh, same slide as I showed yesterday. Uh, I guess I'm a scientist. I, 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 I don't stick to defining what's useful to the EU. I'm actually interested in uh, what synthetic biology is doing to science, and I really like this Richard Feynman quote, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So I think for the sort of basic science approach, this is the core concept of synthetic biology. We're trying to build things because that way is the best way to learn about biology. Uh, and some of these slides from yesterday, uh, another sort of really like one sentence, uh, let's say, definition of scientific definition of synthetic biology is called next generation molecular biology. It has become cheaper, it has become more accurate. It's fundamental science, but it's also heavily um, mixed with engineering principles. So we'll hear a lot about these concepts of robustness, standardization. We like concepts such as open sourceness. This is based on the experiences we had in the uh, development of the information technology. Um, and it's highly interdisciplinary, that's really at the core of it. We think we are now mastering DNA technologies to the level where we can, you know, we can pick building blocks from nature and puzzle them together into something useful in a synthetic biology organism. And actually the example about vanilla that we heard from the previous talk is one of the most beautiful examples of that. I mean, imagine that they took an enzyme from a fungi, a human being, and a plant, put it into a yeast, and then they produce a product that we eat. I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, but I mean, the product is the same as what you make from wood, or you make from oil. So there's no different in the product. It's, it's only the, you know, it's just the approach of making it. So there are many opportunities. We can get better, cheaper food, renewable energy. We can maybe clean up, uh, pollutants from the environment, we can sense pollutants, we can sense toxic compounds, we can sense diseases, we can even sense explosives maybe out in, in nature. So many opportunities in synthetic biology, also many controversies. Synthetic life, should we actually mess up with, you know, what we, we think and define as life? Um, I was going to mention these gene drives, which are really controversial, particularly in the, the CRISPR generation here. So, gene drives, we haven't really elaborated on, but sort of this idea that you can, you can create molecular biology constructs that are changing DNA and continuously change DNA throughout population and take over population. So for example, taking over a whole mosquito population so that you no longer get malaria. That, that would be a positive example of the use of the gene drive. Um, the extinction, do we want to revive the mammoth, uh, the dinosaurs, if any of you saw uh, Jurassic Park? Maybe that's a little bit far-fetched, but nevertheless, it's a vision uh, that you can sort of at least theoretically maybe think is possible sometimes in the future. And then biological weapons, gene therapy, gene host. Standards, it's actually something which is quite important in, in synthetic biology. And I want to just try and explain to you, like, I'm sure all of you have like, an idea what a standard is, but why are standards important? And, uh, and also, uh, I'm going to show you know, uh, 
We had a lot of Norwegian uh, commercials and pictures from Norway in the snow. So I wanted to show you a Danish product here that we're very proud of. It's, it's not Kennedy and it's not Obama, but it's the chair, if you know. It's the chair. <laughs> so we're very proud of trying to trend in Denmark. It's probably made of Indonesian wood, by the way. But we are, we are proud of the science. So what does this to do with standards? Well, I want to give you an example of uh, something where, you, where it might be useful to have a standard for what is the chair. What's the chair? Any idea? Or what would be a standard description of a chair? Something with... It's elevated from the ground, has a flat surface that you can sit on, may even have a flat surface that you can lean your back against. That would be one definition. This will fit the definition. This is probably a good chair in front of <laughs> for most of the year, right? It's not a really good chair in Indonesia. It's <laughs> not for a long time at least. It's made of ice. So maybe you can put to the standard description that um, it should probably be a chair at temperatures between this and that. That would be a useful standard to add to the you know, standard description of a chair. Uh, this was a chair. <laughs> uh, it's no longer a chair, I guess, from the this, you know, definition of a chair. So maybe you also want to add some description that it needs to be able to hold a certain amount of weight. And so on and so on. So the same goes for biological parts. We haven't actually been able to think about that for many decades in, in molecular biology, but because we've become so good at designing um, you know, DNA, we can actually start thinking about what is what is the DNA standard? What is the standard for a promoter that we heard about in the first talk? What's the standard for a gene? We heard about that it has to start with an ATG and a stop codon. Uh, that could be a sort of standard description, right? But there could be many other things, you know. Um, a gene might work in yeast, but not in E. coli. So you know, these are useful things to actually consider and are important. And the standards actually uh, enable collaborations, right? It's, it's useful to know whether a chair works both in Indonesia and in Tromsø. Uh, just like it's useful to know whether a gene works both in yeast or E. coli, uh, or at certain temperatures. Um, another example of standards that I've heard is, and, and, and this is another fun example, um, we heard about the EU and how we are trying to agree things. You know, the EU is a, you know, uh, uh, you know, many countries in Europe that are sort of united. Um, and then, then you, you actually realize that to be able to collaborate among these, you have to have standards for different things. So a really great example in Europe is chocolate. Everyone knows chocolate. But what's chocolate? How many years do you think it took EU to decide the definition of chocolate. Any? 20 years. What? 20 years. 20 years. So he's a European. I don't want to <laughs> I think you're wrong. I think the yeah. answer is 10 years. Okay, so the European Parliament, or people within there, discussed for 10 years what is chocolate. And it's, it sounds crazy, but, but there's a reason for this. That's because in England, for them, they like chocolate with a lot of fat and a lot of milk in it. That's chocolate to them. In Switzerland, it has to have a lot of cocoa, right? That's chocolate to them. So then they start trading, and you know, you get chocolate from England to Switzerland, and then people from Switzerland eat British chocolate and say, this is not chocolate. And that sort of makes it hard to, to trade between countries. So it's nice to have some definitions, so that you know, when I buy something that says chocolate, it's actual chocolate. We heard about natural vanilla before, right? So that you also need a standard. What is a natural vanilla? We, we didn't discuss this, but actually it's a funny definition, right? So you can make natural vanilla by putting human genes, plant genes, fungi genes into yeast definition. So there's some definitions there that, for example, if you extract, I believe that the rule is if you extract Vanillin from inside yeast, you cannot call it natural anymore. But if somehow 
Yeast makes mandolin with magic or synthetic biology and it secretes mandolin, so now it's outside the cell. Then it, you can call it natural mandolin. You can also call it natural mandolin if you make it from trees, even though there's a lot of chemical processing involved afterwards, right? That's still natural. So it's nice to know what the definition of <coughs> Good. So I'll come back to standards when we go really detailed into DNA. I also show this because it's, as I said yesterday, one of my favorite slides. Just to remind you of why we're here today, basically. The development in computer technology, the development in sequencing DNA, and the development in, in, in basically uh, synthesizing DNA. I'll go more in detail than I did yesterday on this, so maybe in the next 10-15 minutes, a little bit about the story of recombinant DNA technologies. So let's start with uh, Watson and Crick, who suggested, that was the word, right? How genes are made out of A, T, C's, and G's, and uh, uh, information in biology is transferred from generation to generation, uh, and solve the structure of the double helix, of course. So, at least it was a big enough finding so that they actually got the Nobel Prize in 62. But let's start our story again around 1950. That genes consist of ATCs and Gs, nucleotides, that we heard about beautifully in the first talk today, to actually knowing <coughs> genetic code. So basically, how does the information in nucleotides transfer to uh, proteins, or what we call it, what we know as the genetic code, right? the genetic code, right, that looks like. So that took roughly 15 years. And I had the question from Dami yesterday, so how does Microsoft store information in DNA? Um, well, there are many ways to do that, but Nature already invented one, right? So this is information storage. You have three nucleotides, you have four different nucleotides in three different positions, so now you can start encoding something, something else, something else, information, which in this case is proteins. The central dogma, I agree, that's a very kind of a religious phrase. So, but people have been religious about the central dogma. This is really the rule of how information flows in biology. It is the major rule, it is how information flows. There is many exceptions to it today because we know so much about political biology. Okay. Moving 10 years, around 1970s, you know, now we know what gene consists of, A, T, C, C, G, we know how it's translated into proteins. Um, and I talked about a scientific method yesterday. Now we want to study, you know, what's out there. We just want to read how does biology look like. And what was important now is we should be able to have some simple method to actually read DNA uh, out in nature. And that was initially developed by Fred Sanger. Most people uh, refer to this as the Sanger DNA sequencing technology. Um, developed in the early 70s, late 60s, I believe. Ten years later, Sanger got the Nobel Prize for this technology. Actually, it was the second Nobel Prize. Right? That's, that's pretty cool. So we also have pro protein structure work. Uh, he's one of the, you know, I don't know, I think there's only two or three people who actually gotten two Nobel Prizes within the same field. Um, and I heard the story actually that at Imperial College, they had this, uh, they had this club where the, um, every year they have a party, and if you have a Nobel Prize, people have champagne, and uh, the Nobel Prize laureates at Imperial College, they will sign your champagne bottle. So when Fred Sanger was there, he would be signing the champagne bottles twice. Yeah. Okay, another important thing happened that we've talked a lot about and it's really important for recombinant DNA technology is uh, the discovery of restriction enzyme and the use in, in biotechnology and biology. Another Nobel Prize. This is a natural defense system in bacteria. So these are enzymes that recognize foreign DNA and chop it up. So does that sound similar to something we've heard before? Yeah, CRISPR. Right? We've heard a lot about CRISPR. We hear a little bit more today. So it's interesting how this is sort of history repeating itself. So a bacterial defense system 
can be used for biotechnology. So this was sort of the, uh, you know, the first technologies that made us basically cut and paste uh, DNA molecules together. So that was pretty hard. You had to sort of find enough DNA to cut and paste. So this was really hard to work with. Even now, you actually sort of kept the scissors now in the 70s. So that changed with two really important things in the 80s. Well, this was developed throughout the 70s and refined in the early 80s. This is known as solid phase phosphamidite chemistry. So solid phase chemistry, another Nobel Prize. Uh, so this is allows you to take simple chemicals and build DNA molecules of a certain length. We heard about oligos, oligonucleotide primers, they're known as. So this way you can take simple building blocks and make nucleotides of a length of 100 to 200. Uh, basis. Um, and that quickly, and that was that you could exponentially amplify DNA by using two oligonucleotides on each strand of top strand of DNA. And then a polymerase that extends those nucleotides. That is the famous polychain reaction. It's such a simple idea that I don't know how many people must have, you know, been annoyed by the fact that this guy actually discovered this. It was so obvious, it must have been so obvious for five years that, you know, this trick would exponentially amplify DNA. It still took five years from the availability of oligonucleotides. It only took the Nobel Prize Committee around five years to give him the Nobel Prize for this simple technology. I mean, and that's really rare in science. So everybody really sort of realized um, how important that technology really enabled us to work with DNA and not just rely on natural sources of DNA, but actually amplify the DNA we wanted to work with. If any of you watch television shows like CSI, you know, so basically crime investigation using DNA from you know crime scenes, this is totally a science enabled by this one technology. Because otherwise we would never have been able to sort of find DNA from blood samples or the like. So we can amplify that by PCR. So, what else? The human genome sequence, this is the first time we see this bolded guy, Craig Bender. Uh, so he was one of the main characters in the sequencing of the human genome. Kind of a controversial guy, has a lot of one-liners and a lot of you know, controversial ideas about science, but he was extremely important for developing the, and actually, it's important to say that what was important for the success of the Human Genome Project was things like standardizing data handling. It was not really a lot of technology development. They just took a lot of Sanger sequences, really. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Spent a lot of money on Sanger sequencing generated a lot of data. So it was about data handling and project management. And I think this is really a place where Craig Bender excelled as a sort of a science manager and, and why he made a difference in this project. Um, no Nobel Prizes, but I work in Stockholm and I can tell you that Craig Bender never rejects an invitation to give a talk in Stockholm for some weird reason. So I think we're just waiting for the for like the biggest success of knowing the human genome to cure some disease and then the, the Nobel Prize will be there. Um, I don't, maybe he's too controversial with Eric and now he's doing synthetic organisms so maybe he disqualified himself. I don't know. But someone will get it. So this was his next work, right? And so he's very visionary if nothing else, I must say. After finishing the Human Genome Project, he actually realized that if you want to go to the next step of understanding biology, you need to be able to recreate biology. So, I talked about this yesterday, so I'll not repeat a lot there, but... So he was the first one to be able to write from simple, you know, chemical parts, phosphoamidite chemistry, solid phase chemistry, oligonucleotides, assembling oligonucleotides, assembling larger pieces of DNA in the end, creating a whole genome based on these technologies that I will go a little bit further into in a minute. And 
replacing a genome in a living organism with a synthetic genome. They call it a minimal genome, so basically to remove all genes that were not essential for this living organism to still be alive. And that was sort of my, my photography on the first page of my talk. Okay, so uh, what's next? Well, again, I think we, we're going to learn a lot from DNA sequencing, and I think DNA sequencing is this mm -hmm. so efficient, so inexpensive, so fast today. Um, we're going to learn from both from the processes that are involved in synthesizing DNA, all the projects, and we're also going to take some of the technologies that were developed uh, in the recent years on DNA sequencing and then use them for DNA synthesis instead. So this is a very recent example. This is from a <coughs> Korean uh, research group actually um, and we published in Nature Communications last year I believe. But they call it sniper homing. It has nothing to do with this guy on the left. Although the actual, the actual idea is to use some of these very powerful technologies of sequencing uh, to actually synthesize DNA instead. So the fact is that when we sequence DNA, we do that by synthesizing DNA. So, and that's not a microarray, that's why it's so cheap. So we can make a lot of DNA very cheap, but the problem is it's error prone. So when we make DNA like this, it's not like the oligonucleotides we buy from companies based on fossil amidite chemistry. This is much more error prone. It doesn't matter when we sequence because we just sequence a lot and then the errors, they sort of, uh, you know, we just uh, rule them out by statistics, basically. So what these guys realized, and others have realized with similar technologies, is that you can just basically sequence, synthesize a lot of DNA in small amounts. A lot of them will have mistakes, but some of them will not. So if you can have a technology that releases the small DNA parts that do not have mistakes, how do you do that? How do you use sequencing to find out where the mistakes are? So you make a lot of small of DNA, you do, then do the next gen sequencing on the microarray. Okay, so now we know where on the microarray we have the correct DNA and where the wrong DNA. So how do you proceed? And this is where they made a difference in this paper. So basically they use, micro, my, they use uh, microscopy and a laser gun. That's where the sniper comes in. So basically what they do is that after next gen sequencing, they know what spots on the microarray array contain the correct sequence and then they shoot on that spot with a laser. So you get release of the correct DNA and only correct DNA. And then you can use different methods to assemble that DNA and that's a whole other story. I can sort of give you some examples later. But, but that's the concept. And it's just to give you a taste of where DNA synthesis is going. Basically, to read and to write and to make books in an alphabet, you need to be able to read and you need to be able to write. And, well, the genetic code we learned around 1960, uh, we learned to sequence DNA in the 70s. And we learned actually to write DNA in the 90s, and now it's becoming really cheap. So how do you assemble DNA? So we can synthesize small pieces of DNA with chemistry. But you need biological molecules to make large pieces of DNA. Uh, so you can synthesize small pieces of DNA, um, and then you need to assemble those into bigger constructs, ultimately a whole genome. Although that's only been done twice in the future. Uh, so how do you do that? So I, I have a good friend who, who, who taught me when he teaches. He calls this molecular Velcro. Everyone knows what Velcro is, right? So I talked about restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes recognize specific DNA sequences and make a cut. So some restriction enzymes cut like this. The problem with doing that, okay, so you get a break, but you don't get any molecular velcro. So this is a very inefficient way of cutting and facing DNA, because when you cut here, these two strands don't really have any affinity to support each other. But when you have enzymes that cut like this, then you have this C and G attracting each other, right? And A and T. So 
in a way you get molecular Velcro. Um, so this was, you know, and, and you know, hundreds and probably thousands of restriction enzymes are known, recognizing different sequences, giving different types of molecular Velcro. There are two problems with restriction enzymes. There's one big advantage of restriction enzymes, that is we've used them for 40 years, so we're really good at it. And people, that's what you really use it still. Uh, there are two problems. Firstly, you need the sequence for this enzyme to cut, right? So, you cannot use this enzyme to build something big, because this sequence will randomly be available all over your DNA if you have a lot of DNA. So you can only use these enzymes if they are not available within the construct that you are sort of cutting and pasting. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is that the molecular Velcro is not very good. There's basically too few nucleotides having affinity towards each other uh, for this uh, method to be efficient. Uh, so in the recent two decades or so, a lot of methodologies have been developed that solves these two problems, and I will give you a few examples in a minute. So the two problems I'll remind you is one, uh, this is sequence dependent. You need this enzyme, you need the site to be there, and you need it to be absent from other in the, in the DNA. And it's inefficient. The assembly is inefficient, the developer is not very good. So when you actually try and inject your DNA into a living organism, it will fall apart and will not be injected. That's the main problem with restriction enzymes. Uh, the sequence dependence is less important these days. And we are getting a little bit of a renaissance for restriction enzymes. And the reason why is that we can synthesize DNA. And we just order DNA by mail. So we're no longer depending on the natural source of DNA. So that means we can just, we can just tell the company to avoid these sites where we want them to be avoided and to be present where we want them to be present. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so that's probably going to revive the use of restriction enzymes a bit. Now we'll talk a little bit and return to standardization. Um, Lego, another famous Danish product that we have brought up, and, and it's, if you Google pictures of synthetic biology, I would promise you every 50 picture will have something to do with Lego. Somehow people, a lot of people globally know what Lego is. Uh, and it's kind of a nice uh, sort of illustration of how people think about synthetic biology, that it's bricks that you can, you know, cut and paste together and recombine creatively. But there's not an, actually an, an important point with Lego, and that is the way you assemble Lego is standardized. Right? It's always the same way you assemble Lego. I, uh, how many of you know Lego? <laughs> how many of you play Lego? That's, that's the best toy on the planet. Uh, but it's really, and it's actually very high quality plastic. You know, it's durable. It's almost impossible to destroy. So it's kind of, a, you know, it's a standard toy which is available all over the world, right? People know how to assemble it. And this is why people like to know, you know, use this uh, as a sort of an illustration of what we aim at doing in synthetic biology. So uh, Tom Knight, one of the sort of big, uh, sort of the uh, pioneers of synthetic biology, he proposed, together with others, this concept of biobricks, which is like the molecular Lego. Um, and so the, the idea is that what if we, instead of everyone treating how to assemble DNA differently, we all agree on a standard, so we always assemble the parts the same way. It's a very controversial idea in biology. Uh, really, totally crazy, it never worked, but it, I mean, but it really inspired a whole generation of synthetic biologists and really inspired the and it's used heavily in the iGEM competition that we've heard a lot about. Uh, because it, again, it enables collaborations. And it actually sort of gathers people. So you have all these students all over the world. And, you know, they have all these creative ideas. But they are bound by the rules of how they assemble DNA. And then that sort of brings them together and they can share the parts. And, you know, when they start the project, 
they get you know thousands of DNA parts that they can then creatively try and build something else uh, uh, using. Having said that, and when I said that the vibrate part never really worked as it maybe it was intended initially, is that within the IGM, millions of other ideas of how to assemble DNA of course came up. So if you go in and look on the standards in the IGM uh, webpage, there are now hundreds of standards of how people assemble DNA. So that's sort of contrary to the idea. Uh, but this just shows that we also don't like to be too restricted by standards, you know. Uh, when you use these restriction enzymes, you're bound to have those sites all over and you're bound to share parts and you, you know, that is also restricting your creativity. Okay, so how does a standard in local biology look like? So this was one of the initial designs of Biobricks. So these letters, these are restriction enzymes, doesn't really matter what they are, but they are different restriction enzymes. And so, I just wanted to illustrate you this, how, how Biobricks in this works. So, what you have here is a plasmid that we heard about in the first call. It has a part, which is blue, and what you want to do is you want to add a green DNA piece to this construct. So, you want to add the blue to the green here. Okay? So, what you do is you take the restriction enzyme, you cut with the P e and S, and you get this piece. E, you can fuse E with E, that's no surprise, but you can also fuse the S enzyme site with the X, and upon doing that you destroy both sides. Sorry, you destroy the S side. So what you see is that when you actually fuse this with this, you remake E, you remake X, you remake, and S and P is conserved. So notice one thing, this looks exactly like the first design, except that you're not on the blue part there. What, that means that you can now treat this exactly like you did here. You can come in with a red part. So you, it's brick built, right? So you can continue this process over and over again. And you can build more and more biological parts in this design. Um, there's a lot of restrictions to when you do that. But it also enables a lot of creativity. So it, 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 people have had a lot of fun sort of trying to stick to that rule while building uh, synthetic biology designs. Then you can build these repositories that we also talked about yesterday. Uh, you know, basically freezers who stand all over the world and people who want to mail you DNA. You know, I, I want this in this promoter, this gene, this terminator, this plasmid. And you just click and they will send it to you. And you can, you can use the biobrick uh, restriction enzymes to cut and paste. So that was examples of using restriction enzymes, sort of the basics of that. Uh, and how that has been used in an attempt to standardize uh, cloning with the synthetic biology. But there are other really important methods out there to actually assemble DNA. This is one of the most famous ones. Mostly this is famous, I think, because Dan Gibson is working with Craig Bender, who is a big guy. Uh, so he's publishing in all the big journals and promoting Dan Gibson, who actually invented this technology. So this is a technology that Dan Gibson invented while he was trying to create the first synthetic genome. So they, they realized, and this is one of the spin-off technologies that comes from a big project. They realized, okay, we don't have a good enough DNA assembly technology, we have to invent a new one to be able to synthesize our genome. So Dan Gibson tried a lot of things and came up with this technology, which is just based on you have homology between two double stranded pieces of DNA, and you have an enzyme that chews back here, and it will chew back on the other side here, in this direction. Then you'll get affinity, you'll get molecular velcro between these two strands, but you also get holes here. Then you have another enzyme that fills out the hole, and finally you have a, a glue, an enzyme that glues together this new, this recombinant piece of DNA. Uh, so pretty simple idea, three enzymes, and then you basically just perfectionize the, the actual protocol. So the protocol basically is you have homology between two, two DNA strands. You put in three enzymes, you do a little bit of heating, and then you transform. And, and notice that here there are no A, C, Cs, and Gs. You need to have homology between these two, but it can be any homology. So you no longer have sequence restriction. You don't have to have a specific context of ACCs and Gs, you can fuse 
any DNA molecule you, you would want. Um, <laughs> this is just to show you when creativity and molecular cloning goes completely crazy. This is uh, a technology which started out as someone called me Golden Gate from Golden Break, and people do crazy complex DNA assembly in a standardized fashion using these technologies. Uh, so this enables you to do uh, big libraries of different combinations of biological parts. Uh, so we learn about promoters, coding sequences, we also need something called terminators to stop transcription. Sometimes we need an address on our protein, a signal peptide that tells the protein where to go in the cell, and so forth. And you may want to mix and match these different uh, features of a gene. And you may not, you may have many accessible, but you don't know which ones work together the best. So one way of addressing that is to do all combinations and then have some kind of screen for finding out which one is the best. And technologies like this enable this. Um, but it really enables is, is software. Because it starts getting a little bit complicated to, to have this in your head when you actually do these designs. So people have realized that. And now a lot of software has been developed to actually facilitate these processes. This is a, a particular nice one that I have no of. It's called J5. But it was uh, developed by this guy Nathan Wilson, which is one of my friends. Um, the cool thing about J5 is, is, is by the way, it's been commercialized uh, in a company called Tesselogen in the US. Um, what's nice about this is, so basically, what this software will do is that you you will tell the software, I want this uh, construct made. I want this piece of DNA made. Then you will tell the software, this is my favorite technology for assembling DNA. So it has a lot of different technologies in there, you know. It could be restriction enzymes, it could be Gibson cloning that we learned about. Then you can tell the software, I have this and this in my freezer. And it will take that into account. And then you can tell the software, um, GenScript just dropped the prices of synthetic DNA so that it now costs this and this much. And then, uh, then the software will tell you what's the cheapest way and most efficient way of making this construct using your favorite methodology. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and it'll basically tell you, you need to order this, and you already have this, and then you do this, and then you have your DNA. This is going to be the future of DNA assembly, I'm sure. Um, many types of these kinds of software are wrong. Uh, this is one of the only ones that takes the price into account, which is kind of nice, I think. And takes reuse of parts in your freezer into account. Okay, so the last thing, which is still awake. Um, <laughs> fortunately for me, this is my, this is my child. So, uh, so I, I need to take the opportunity to tell you about my child. Uh, it's called uh, user cloning or uracil excision cloning. Just like Gibson, just like Gibson. It's a way of creating molecular Velcro. That's all it is. In my view, it's one of the simplest, it's one of the most versatile, and it's one of the most inexpensive methods around. And it's, it's basically open source. I developed one of the enzymes that we use for this, uh, and I, as an advertisement, I'm, I'm happy to give it away for free. I don't make any money out of the technology. People cite my papers, which is nice, but that's that's all the same I get from. So you can do a lot of things. I'll go into detail about that. So let me just tell you with a little sort of a very simple animation how to be a simple uh, two pieces of DNA with. Uh, here, so they come up with all the. I didn't come up with the conceptual idea of juice cloning, I just made it better. It's better with some of my colors. Okay, what do you do if you use a clone? You have two pieces of DNA, and you just have a single strand uh, illustrated. So, what I do when I, instead of using a software, there's also a software for doing this, but it's so simple that I think it's worth actually just knowing how to do. What I do when I do use a cloning is that I look for A and the T, which is spaced apart, roughly 7 to 15 nucleotides. So it doesn't really matter which one it is. It could be this A and this T. It could be this and this, and I have way too many examples. 
could be a full strength, right? Okay, so finally, I settle for one. So in this case, I settle for this A and this T. And then I amplify the two pieces of DNA with the polychain reaction, PCR. That's done with a small oligonucleotide, which will amplify DNA in this direction. But you see something, and this is where the uracil comes in. So what's uracil doing in DNA? Uh, well, normally we don't consider uracils in DNA, uh, but it does naturally occur in DNA as a mistake. Um, sometimes it's incorporated um, uh, as a base pair with A. That's actually fine, because that's not a mutagenic event. So it happens naturally in living cells, uh, and that's fine, nothing happens really. But, uh, this case, cytosine can actually undergo deamination. So, an amine group can leave cytosine, then cytosine becomes uracil, and then you see, then this C will suddenly base pair with an A. So this is a mutagenic event. That's important to remember. Uh, in our case, we just replace the T with the U, so it's not mutagenic. And we simply do that by telling the company to synthesize this small piece of DNA with the U here. All right. The cool thing is that nature developed another enzyme that removed the U, because nature see it as a mutagenic event. So it, 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 it developed a, nature developed a rescue system to remove your cells. So we took that enzyme, purified it, and when we treat our DNA, it will remove the U. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of detail in a moment. Then this becomes unstable. It's a short piece of DNA will basically fall off. And now you have two pieces of DNA, two pieces of molecular Velcro. Okay? And you can fuse those together. And importantly, because you can pick the distance between the A and the T, you can make good Velcro, much better Velcro than with restriction enzymes. So this is stable enough to transform directly into a living organism. Um, and, and then you have, you know, recombinant uh, DNA inside of a living organism. This is how it looks when we go that one. We have G's and C's, space pairing, A's and T's, A's and C's. Okay? You can replace this with a U. You can see you have the same type of base pairing. You can also see what happens when you're in here, and then you get yourself with the same molecule. Alright. Then we treat it with one enzyme, it will remove the U. We also treat it with another enzyme. This actually is very unstable and it will, it will break uh, spontaneously. But we want to control how it breaks, so we have another enzyme. The mix of these two enzymes is commercially available, it's quite a cheap enzyme actually. So. I didn't make that, uh, I don't make money out of selling it. Uh, it's as cheap as a restriction enzyme, the mix of these two. You can buy it with New England Biolabs. You have some of the DNA falling off, you can make molecular Velcro. Alright. Imagine you do this on two pieces of DNA, and you make this part compatible with this part, this part compatible with this part, then you suddenly have circular DNA, in particular in bacteria, this is really important. Uh, in a model bacterium like E. coli, you need to have circular DNA uh, to be able, with strong Velcro, to be able to transform and get the DNA inside. Okay, but you can also imagine just having homologous region in each end of one piece of DNA, and then this will become a circular molecule. This is a very efficient one molecule chemical reaction. So when you do this, this is extremely efficient way of forming. And you can actually do many, many fragments at the same time. So this is homologous uh, with this region, uh, this is with this region, and this with this. Then you your cell excision, and then you send three fragments um, at the same time. So then you rather want to first assemble, you know, some <coughs> populations, and then break those, and then assemble them afterwards. So we never go beyond assembling seven pieces of DNA at the same time. So uh, we heard about CRISPR and how we can introduce mutations sort of randomly uh, by, you know, making mix in DNA and then the natural um, repair mechanism will sometimes make errors and you get small deletions or insertions. Um, 
You can do that much more accurately when you work with DNA in vitro, so you can actually deliberately make the mistakes you want if you want to introduce a mutation like, like marker and X here. This is one of the most heavily used ways of introducing mute mutations in plasmid DNA. It's known as WAPS whole plasmid synthesis. So basically you use PCR to synthesize the whole plasmid. And when you do that, you introduce an error in the DNA, and that will then be amplified and you transform the new piece of DNA with an error into your uh, into your living organism. You can do the same thing with your solicitation, not again here, A U. AU homology between these two regions and, and a mutation here. This is to illustrate that you can also make, make an insertion, you can make a deletion, and you can form big fragments like so sort of form. Okay, the protocol. <coughs> Why am I so excited? Not just because I think it's simple and enables us to do a lot of things, it's also because the protocol, and if you've done experimental molecular biology, you know how important the simplicity of the protocol is. It's important because stuff stops working. You make mistakes. So if you want to troubleshoot a protocol, how many steps do you want to troubleshoot, right? The fewer the steps, the fewer the steps you have to troubleshoot. We only use two enzymes. We only, you know, only two enzymes can go bad. Um, you know, only one buffer, uh, and so on. So this is just a simple comparison between what I call old school, this is restriction enzyme based cloning and your solicitation. Okay, let's say we start with PCR. Let's forget about this. Then you basically you have your uracil, you have your enzyme to remove uracil. This happens at 37 degrees. You then lower the temperature. That's because you want the velcro to come together. And then you transform it. Mm -hmm. That's how simple it is to plug and paste DNA using this method. This protocol is much longer for several reasons. First, you do PCR. Now, uh, you need to purify PCR normally when you use a restriction enzyme. Because otherwise, when you cut with your restriction enzyme, the polymerase will just fill in whatever you cut. And then you won't be able, then you won't have Velcro. Um, for specific reasons, because of the orientation of how you put in your cells, this is not necessary. Basically, the polymerase cannot uh, add nucleosides to this product. Then we have to uh, have the enzyme working, the restriction enzyme digest. Takes an hour or so. And then, because the velcro is not strong enough, we need to add the glue enzyme. This is the ligase. This is a, known to be a quite inefficient enzyme. Plus, you cannot just add it here because you have to purify away the restriction enzyme. Otherwise, every time you glue something together, it will be cut apart again by the restriction enzyme, right? So, there's a lot of purification involved here, and a lot of sort of buffer changes. It doesn't look like much, but I can tell you, in the lab, it makes a, a whole world difference that your protocol is simple. In sequence restrictions, we don't need the glue enzyme ligation. We can fuse many different DNA parts together. Um, you can also do similar stuff by something called overlap PCR, but uh, this method has fewer problems. It's very simple, it's inexpensive. And what it did to us in the lab, when I started developing this technology, a typical PhD project was cloning a few genes and characterizing the proteins when produced in an organism. What this changed our life, so instead of just picking one, we picked 50 or 100 because it just enabled us to work with much more DNA. A few disadvantages as always. We, we developed this because we wanted to spend less time on making DNA constructs. We ended up spending the same time on making DNA constructs, but we just made much more DNA. That's, that's, that's just an interesting observation. The urine is a little bit more expensive when you work with DNA. The, uh, PCR polymerase is fairly expensive. It needs to be a special one. But I made one, and it's really available. Um, right, and you need to PCR amplify your DNA. Right before, um, sometimes it's overwhelming to be able to, you know, to try and understand how these technologies work. And it really enable you to start working if you can use a simple software. This is a beautiful example. It looks like this, the most recent version. 
available here from a user from the technical university. I, I, did, I wasn't involved. Other groups were doing this. What the software will do is that you can paste in text sequences of two pieces of DNA. You want to fuse them together, or 10 pieces or 20 pieces. And then the software will give you the oligonucleotide that you need to order to amplify your DNA, and you will so, you know, assemble them. So very simple. Just tell it what you want assembled. It will give you the oligonucleotides. You send the order to a company, you get the oligonucleotides, you do PCR, and you assemble the DNA. So that's a really nice tool that enables uh, sort of spreading this technology. Okay, at the end, where where are we going with this technology? I, I can tell you, I can show you crazy things we can do. This is one of the most recent things that I'm. Um, I think it's kind of cool. When I started doing metabolic engineering, I was faced with the challenge that you don't want to do a lot of things on plasmids. We talked a lot about plasmids, small circular DNA molecules that uh, bacteria can host. But these can be sort of unreliable sources of uh, DNA for like a robust cell factory. So people are more interested in having stuff integrated on the genome of living organisms. And I was a little bit scared about this in the beginning because I thought that that was really hard to put, let's say, advanced DNA construct on the genome of living organisms. But this, and we've heard about CRISPR and how you can do this today. This is another technology that was developed in my lab. This basically enables you to clone DNA just like you do in plasma. In fact, you are cloning a plasma, but when you transform it into the bacteria, it will recognize this plasma and integrate it on the genome. It's not as efficient as, as uh, just making a plasma, but it's as, it's as simple. So basically, what it means is that, so this is an example of a promoted crowding expression of a GFP, free fluorescent protein. We assemble it by years of existing plane into this plasma, transform it into E. coli, and check it out. This many fluorescent E. coli colonies turn up on the plate. And they're all integrated on the genome, which I think is kind of cool. This is published. And then we did the craziest thing we, we, you know, we wanted to see how far can we go with this. And this was not very efficient, I must say, but I'm so quite proud that it worked. So we were able to assemble six fragments of DNA. This is a pathway um, from a plant making an orange compound, carotenoid. So when it's assembled correctly in E. coli, E. coli turns orange. And so basically we were able to put this on the genome, this technology, four genes, four plant genes, six different DNA fragments directly on the genome, and whoa, not as many colonies as you saw before, but they, they are orange. That was a big success. Biology. And uh, previously what you did was that you, if you were working with plasmids, you know, you probably would have your favorite plasma in the freezer, uh, maybe two, or maybe three, or maybe ten. And uh, nowadays, we can get access to hundreds of different plasmas with different properties. They may propagate bacteria in 500 copies or only one copy. And, you know, which one should I choose? What would work best for my production scenario? You never know, it's really hard to predict. So why don't we instead make a standardized technology that enables you to test all the combinations quickly? That's what we did. So again, our favorite criteria. So we have no idea which one would be the winner. So let's just test them all. And that's where synthetic biology tools and analysis. So we tried a pathway, we tried production of a, a membrane protein. And you can see those big differences in how efficient these uh, microorganisms actually perform. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the type of exercises you can you can sort of do these things with this technology. So returning lastly to uh, vendors minimal genome, I, I mean I have to apologize, I cannot tell you how to create life. Uh, some, would, some would claim that this is the closest we ever got uh, human beings to creating life from scratch. I would just uh, suggest that we've learned a lot of technologies that are useful to us. We haven't learned a lot about creating life, but a lot of spin-off technologies. We learned about Gibson cloning that was developed to enable creating a whole genome. Um, 
talked about data management with APS. This also enabled this project. The minimal genome. How do you define what genes are essential and non-essential? Uh, well, they had to develop new methodologies to uh, knock out genes to do this in a very efficient way. So that was developed during this project. Gibson cloning, uh, improved versions of yeast model recombination, another type of DNA sampling, uh, and just simple handling of DNA fragments. So this was, to my knowledge, one of the biggest challenges in this project. Okay, we can handle small pieces of DNA with pipettes that yet that you're going to try at this uh, meeting. But if you take a genome into a pipette, you destroy the genome. So how do you how do you transfer a genome practically? That is really hard. I believe that took these guys many many years, and it, it involves crazy things like encapsulating the DNA in a gel, and then you know how do you handle a gel and how do you get a gel into a living cell, and I don't know, but, but you know, just to say that it's fundamental science to, to do these things, and you learn a lot about molecular biology doing it, even though there's absolutely no use of this minimal genome marketing. <coughs> Good. That was the words. I'm, I'm sorry for the, the kind of heavy DNA juggling after lunch. I'm happy to take questions if you are aware.